Okay, we've got a star panel. I'm just going to dive right into it. You know, they all took sort of non-traditional paths because let's be honest, you know, for every good Asian family who wants their children to be a doctor or a lawyer or engineer, they chose non-traditional paths. I'm going to start with Bobby. If not the general manager of the world champion Toronto Raptors, what would you be? I don't know. This is the dream, right? <laughs> um, I think, you know, growing up in a place like Hawaii, I think it'd be a, a much simpler life. I, uh, you know, I'd probably be a beach hippie bum with a little cafe, cooking fried, I don't think so. cooking fried rice. Ooh, that sounds good. <laughs> yeah. That'd okay. be it. Okay. Cooking fried rice, beach bum. Koine, to you, what, if not a dancer, what would you be? It's funny you say fried rice because I love food. I think I would just love to be a chef or something in the food business. I mean, my parents are, so maybe that's where I get it from, but obsessed with food, need it, love it. Okay. I think food, something food. <laughs> to our skaters, the Shib Sibs, Alex and Maya. Maya, you first. If not part of the skating duel, what would you be? I found figure skating when I was four years old, so I was extremely young. But I think if I wasn't a figure skater, I'd still pick something in a creative field. I always thought I'd be a dancer. And honestly, I originally thought I'd be at the Olympics by myself, not in a duo. But, you know, dreams change and evolve and grow, and it's good. <laughs> Alex? Uh, the, <clears throat> can I defend myself? Um, <laughs> the reason why she says that is because I wanted to be an uh, NBA player when I was a kid. I didn't have the height genes. I can still give or, you a tryout. I, di I didn't, you wouldn't have scouted me at all. I wouldn't have been on your radar uh, at all. But I think figure skating was the right choice for me. Um, our career really took off when we started skating together and our strong relationship that we've had since she was born um, is a large part of our success. So I think I found the right thing. I wouldn't be anywhere without her. Oh, oh. oh. isn't it a nice older brother? Oh, the older brother. We're all right, points there. You know, they're known as the Shib Sibs, so siblings. Do you fight, and what's the worst argument you've ever had? You know, honestly, that's a very popular question that people ask us. People always expect that either we get along all the time or fight all the time, and really, it's neither of those. It's somewhere in between. Yeah, there's no, there's no black and white absolute. Uh, we do get along very well. I don't think we would have been able to survive uh, each other for this long if we didn't. Uh, but I think communication is really our biggest strength because we're always able to work through our disagreements. Most of them happen uh, when it comes to something that we both care about and just having that knowledge that we both care uh, allows us to sort of work through it. Okay. And Koine, to you, you've moved to Hollywood. Um, now you're part of the Hollywood scene and you're a dancer here. How challenging is it for you as an Asian American to find jobs here in Hollywood? Yeah, um, a lot of the times, I think especially for dancers, it's, it's not in my control, you know, and when I want a gig, sometimes I just get denied simply because I'm Asian. Um, they do this thing where sometimes they put you all in a line and they literally come up to you and look at you and if you don't fit the part, they just say thank you so much for coming. So, you know, it is very hard, but at the same time, it's kind of the game. I, I, I love that. I love that I have to work really hard to be where I am. And, you know, it, it is what it is, and it's just the fight, and I love it. Yeah. So glad. Okay, world-famous Toronto Raptors. I, I'm from the Bay Area. You know, you beat the Warriors. Uh, <laughs> Susie, help me here, remember? Oh, my gosh. Um, but... Toughest part for you, Bobby, to be general manager of now the world famous champion Raptors? I think it's, uh, it's the constantness of it. And, I, and I'll say this and kind of give you a scenario. So if every day at your work there were 15 people watching you, and then they, the next day in the papers they wrote about what you did bad or what you did good, and I think there's always that hanging over the team. And I'm a little bit removed because I'm I can kind of choose when I want to be um, out front. But I'm just always attuned to that for our players and our coaches and just how that affects them. And it like today, um, 
we lost to Milwaukee on Saturday, and there was a practice this morning, and I'm just like, man, like, how did they react? How did they come into practice? What was the energy level? And so I think that, and it just keeps, you know, you can just, you know, you could think about that all day. And so I think that's what's the toughest part. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we're so proud. We come Aina's, and Bobby is a Kama Aina, and a Hapa, um, by the way, which is a Hawaiian word that means half. So his mom is Japanese American, his father is a Webster, and so he, <laughs> You get what I mean. Um, so in Hawaii, you know, we say you're hapa. And, and full disclosure, I have three hapa children. And are people confused as to how to identify you, Bobby? You know, I thought a lot about this one because I really think that it, by having a, a mixed race heritage, honestly, I was able to take the best from either side. So I never felt limited or boxed in. Obviously, there are kind of overarching societal and cultural norms that you have to adhere to, but I personally, I never felt that. I think I was always accepted by the Asian community and I was access, accepted by the Caucasian community. And growing up in Hawaii, it, was, it wasn't uncommon to be Hapa. So it, it never, I, never, I don't feel a burden. There's no, there was nothing extra for me. I actually think I was, it was, like freeing for me. Okay, all right. And now, Koine, to you, you mentioned about sometimes being the Asian dancer there. Do you remember there's a famous play called Chorus Line, and there was always just one Asian dancer in Chorus Line. And sometimes that's the part. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but here's a fun fact. When she competed in season uh, six, 14. 14 of So You Think You Can Dance, the, she was competing against a Japanese-American dancer. So to have both of you on at the same season. Yeah. So are we seeing more Asians get into this non-traditional field of dancing? Is it still really one and one only person there? No, I mean, especially in California, there's so many Asian dancers, and a lot of them are Japanese. Um, I think it's incredible. I respect the, the way they dance. There's it's so funny because in, you know, in YouTube videos and stuff when people look up Millennium and these dancers and you see all these Asian dancers in Japan just killing the game. I mean, they are incredible and it just goes to show the discipline and the work ethic and, you know, in, in my position to be standing next to Lex Ishimoto who is right now one of the most incredible dancers of our time. Um, it was an honor. I think we were both kind of standing on the stage when it was just the two of us left. Like, what in the world, two Japanese people, being able to represent, you know, our dance community, but also being able to represent our country and who we are, and it was, and we both got to see our parents, like, right across the stage of us, and to see my parents just, like, standing, it gets me emotional every time, but it was really a really cool, cool, cool experience. Thank you, Corne. And so now to Alex and Maya, I mentioned in the video that you were the first ice dancers of Asian descent to ever win an Olympic medal. That means from any country, they were the first ice dancers of Asian descent, period. Did you understand when you won that bronze medal, did you understand the significance of what it all meant? Maya? To go back more towards the beginning, when we started skating together, we didn't really realize that that was the case because I think that a lot of time people are looking for a roadmap or a way to success. And so it's a little challenging when you don't necessarily see an example that you can directly relate to or imagine being. But we just really loved skating together. And so through the journey and as we progressed in competition, we began to realize that every result that we made was kind of changing history a little bit. And it wasn't too much pressure, it was just something that we were honored that was happening, but that wasn't strictly what motivated us. Yeah, when we, when we first started, um, we just liked it. Uh, and so the first reaction to winning the Olympic medals was um, elation and joy and a lot of pride. Uh, our parents didn't push us away from skating or push us towards skating because they thought it was something that we would be good at 
or successful at, they identified that Maya immediately fell in love with it and they wanted us to be happy. And so as we you know, developed through our career, we realized that there were perceived disadvantages to not only being Asian American or Asian or Japanese American, but also being siblings uh, skating together in a widely seen as a romantic and dramatic sport on ice. Uh, and so that was a bit of a creative challenge for us, and so we had to overcome that. So I've never really seen being Asian as being a disadvantage, and I've never seen any perceived disadvantage as, as that. It's always an opportunity uh, to showcase your strengths, and being unique is what helps us stand out. Uh, and it's taken us very far. Yeah, no, no kidding. Yes, very far. So, you know, I, I couldn't help but just pause when, when I played that video of you winning that bronze medal in that moment in time. And, you know, when the music stopped, I said, you know, emotion. I mean, we saw the emotion that you have. But I, I hope you understand the music. And I made sure that we played the real, the original music when they danced, when they ice skated to that number. It was a song by Coldplay. And you chose that song for a specific reason. Can you tell us about that reason and, and the, the why you chose that song? Sure, so you put a lot of time and thought into the music that you want to skate to at the Olympics. That's the moment where the whole world is watching and we've been training for so long to build up to that very special performance. And for us, Alex kind of alluded to it earlier, there are certain music selections that we can't exactly pick as siblings. So we had to be a little bit more creative and think outside of the box. So we No one wants to see a ship sibs do Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, no, that, 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 I promise that won't happen. <laughs> I, I don't, I wouldn't want to see that either. <laughs> but thankfully, we found Coldplay, and the song Paradise is truly special, and it really wove into our story that we've experienced, the two of us. So, um, Alex, I'm going to go to you. But at any point in time, I mean, you have been competing. Uh, we saw some video when they were competing really young, and they've won U.S. Nationals and World Champion, and, and this was not your first Olympics. I mean, did you ever think... No, I'm, we're too frustrated. We're not going to do this when you, when you made it to the bronze and Team USA. I think it's naive to go into anything that's really like worth attempting because you value the experience um, where you don't anticipate any challenges or um, tribula you know, trials and tribulations. Uh, there were certainly times on a daily basis, um, whether it was, you know, do I put up two more reps um, in the gym? Uh, do we do another run through of our program? Whether it's physical, mental, emotional, there are always situations that you uh, come upon in life that test you. And we've always enjoyed the challenge. And we've been grateful uh, that we've been able to take on those challenges together. Gratitude has been a really important thing for us to realize and embrace because no matter the, um, the, the circumstance or the pressure that we feel in the moment, even at the Olympic Games, being grateful allows you to stay present. Uh, and for something that is so physically geared, uh, like a skating performance, it grounds you and it allows you to recall the basics, uh, which is something that so many people forget as soon as uh, the stakes are high uh, and the emotions are high as well. So, um, yeah, there are, t there are tough times, and everyone in this room has experienced tough times, so it often feels silly to be like, oh, yeah, like the Olympics, getting there was such a tough time. We all deal with tough times, um, but I think it's how we handle them and how we persevere. Well, we're glad you persevered and handled them. So this is kind of a, uh, a question for all our panelists. You know, growing up, um, especially in the Japanese American families, you know, there's always this saying that your parents tell you to, to remember and persevere, you know, gambate, I mean, you know, do that. Any, any saying, I'm going to start with Bobby, that you remember your mom saying, or somebody in Hawaii saying to you, Bobby, as a young kid growing up, that, you know, you remember? I don't remember any saying, but I think there was always, there was an expectation in my family that um, if you were going to do something, you were going to do it really well, and there was a standard of excellence that was expected. And I just remember 
countless car rides home, whether it was a bad game or a bad grade, and the message was, well, if you don't want to do it well, don't do it. You know, it was like, if, if we're going this far and you're going to play basketball or you're going to go to this private high school, like, you're going to, you're going to try your best, you're going to do your best, and you're going to do well. <laughs> And so I think the, the, it was just a standard of excellence, I think, that I don't, you know, you don't think about it in the moment, but there was, mediocrity was never going to be acceptable. There you go. Okay. Cornet, to you, do you remember any um, saying, I mean, your parents are from Japan. Yes. Did they say anything to you to, to say, you know, continue on, persevere? Absolutely. I mean, I think we can all say we just had to meet an expectation and it was not in any negative way it was just that my well my parents always told me um, you can be whatever you want to be in life anything you want to be in life you can be at it you just have to be the best one and I mean like that sounds kind of funny but truly that's that's just what that's just what my parents always told me and you know I thought about that and I'm like really like anything and they're like no yeah my mom would always look at me really seriously and just say, you can be whatever you want, but she better be the best one. <laughs> and I'm dancing and I'm like, okay, so, you know, and when I'm standing up there on So You Think You Can Dance, I'm like, man, I got to be the best. Like, it just is something, but it drove me. And, you know, aside from that, it's, it's the gratitude. Uh, just like how you said, my, my parents just instilled in me since I was little to just be grateful for being here. You know, and my parents came from Japan I mean, yes, and came to America with absolutely nothing. Um, and to, to hear their stories, it, it drives me every day, every single day. And just little things that they've instilled in me, like I have to, when I was, ever since I was little, they would make me say thank you to throwing anything away in the trash can. That I take with me every single day. Anything that I throw away, if it, if it served me a purpose, I, I say thank you. And just little things like that I take on with my dance career, I take on with my life, and yeah, just that. Okay. Yeah. Um, Alex and Maya, to you, what saying from your parents or you've heard, what are, what, what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? It's a mix of some of the things that have been said already. Uh, I think that when we started out on the skating path, there's no expectation that that path leads to the Olympic Games or to international competition or even success. Uh, our mom and our dad came from competitive music backgrounds, and so they were familiar with the notion of subjectivity uh, in anything that is creative or artistic. Um, there's opinion involved, and skating is no different. And so, regardless of um, you know how well you think you do, your your fate or your result is dictated by what judges uh, think of you. Uh, and so. I think that they encouraged us in skating because they wanted us to, um, well, they were really happy that we were doing it together uh, because I think that's every parent's dream, that their children get along and love each other and care for each other. But separate from that, uh, I think that they you know, knew that skating and sport in general, uh, whether it was sport or music, anything that we applied ourselves to would give us so many lessons that we could take with us in life, whether we continued it beyond high school or um, into adult life. Uh, and so they, I think, realized that Maya and I held ourselves to a particularly high standard. Um, and so we always pushed ourselves to try and be the best versions of ourselves that we could be uh, because we weren't in control of what other people necessarily thought. But they did really do an amazing job grounding us by reminding us, why are you doing this? You're doing it because you love it, so be grateful. And then from a very young age, from the beginning, they always encouraged Alex and me to appreciate the relationship and dynamic that we have. And so none of this would be possible. We wouldn't be able to sit next to each other if they didn't teach us how to be good siblings. Yeah, I think um, when Maya was born, our parents really instilled in me the, um, the responsibility and the privilege and the good fortune that I would have to have a younger sibling, someone that could be a friend for life. Uh, you know, when the going got tough in skating, you know, we won't be skating partners for forever, just like we won't be skating for forever. Uh, we won't be the 60-year-old uh, ice skating team at the Olympics. That's not happening. Any, that's not happening. Sorry. Uh, but I think we'll be family for, for life, and that's something that we've always appreciated. So they've really um, kind of given us that message throughout. 
Okay, thank you. So this is a fun question. Uh, last year, the movie Crazy Rich Asians came out and took you know us by storm. My question to our panelists, just think about this. If you were a crazy rich Asian, what would you do with all that crazy money? I'm gonna go to Bobby first. <laughs> Bobby, you go first. Oh. I think being away from Hawaii, I don't get to see my family and friends. So I was thinking crazy rich money, I would get a private plane and have all of my friends and family go to some exotic location. I think that's the thing I don't, I, during the season, we're busy for 11 months out of the year and I don't get to see them and um, just being able to spend time with them. Private plane, okay. Koine, to you. What would you do with all that crazy rich money? Anything in the world. I mean, I would eat a lot of good food. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, definitely a foodie, so go to every restaurant. Um, no, I, I would agree with the traveling. Um, I would just give back to my parents. I mean, if it wasn't for them, I literally wouldn't be here. And if it wasn't for their bravery and their, and, and their determination to move to America, I wouldn't be here. So I would definitely, my parents would be my first priority, my family. Um, and as cliche as this sounds, I just really want to help the homeless. I've always been that. Um, so the, when, I, when I first read the question and I, and I thought to myself, and I was like, man, I don't want to be one of those that just answers like, I want to help so-and-so. But truly, I've, it's always been something of mine. Going to like downtown LA, it, 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 I just want to do something. So I would, that's probably what I would do. And thank you. Thank you, Koine. Yeah. <laughs> Alex and Maya, to you, same question. If you were crazy, crazy rich, what would you do with all that money? Maya? Or Alex, you want to go first? I would donate, uh, protect, and invest in the next generation. And uh, I think protect the environment is really important. Um, that's definitely a significant issue that we're all dealing with. On a much, much lighter note, uh, I would bring an NBA franchise to Seattle and promptly hire, uh, hire me. I, would, I would hire Bobby away from the Toronto Raptors and we would win five consecutive NBA titles before the salary cap um. would just kind of expire. Um, all right. Yeah, so. You guys heard it here first. I'm, it's called putting it out into the universe and then making it happen. Where are we getting happen. the money from? You guys were in the room when we agreed, when we shook hands on yes, this. Yeah. Yes. Okay, uh, Mike, to you. I don't think I can top what Alex just said. These plans, that sounds yeah, like a great right. plan, guys. Um, on a sillier note, I think travel takes a lot of time, so I'd invest in someone figuring out how we can all safely teleport. And, <laughs> right. you know, more time with Amen. family and friends. You can do your work and have that, too. Emphasis on the safely. Safely. Yeah, yeah. Love that. So, um, I'm going to open up to the audience, but first, last question to Bobby. I mean, you know, come on, Toronto Raptors, world champions. And, and you heard Alex, you know, he'd, he'd buy the team and win five. So what's next for the world champions? Uh, keep winning. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I always told my wife that I, before we won, I didn't want to do a ton of, not necessarily public speaking, but kind of talking to kids and mentoring, because I felt like without winning the championship, like, what do you, you know, like, why me? There's a bunch of other me's. But I, I have felt much more of a, um, a desire to, I don't want to say give back, but to do things like this or talk to kids or, you know, try to mentor and advise them to give them, you know, some degree of whatever, you know, whatever luck, but, you know, degree of hard work that's helped me is how can I help? The other kids. All right. Very admirable. All right. I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience. Maybe we can have some house lights up too. And I'm going to ask the audience to, you know, stand up, shout it out. But we need to hear from you. We've got some dynamite panelists. You can ask questions here and they're, they're going to answer. So uh, I'm going to call upon them because I planted. Depending on the question. Okay. Okay. Depending on the question. I planted her. Susie Ruse, I'm calling you first. Susie is a die-hard Warriors fan. Uh -oh. Not answering it. Uh -oh. Not answering it. Die-hard Warriors fan, <laughs> and uh, she uh, 
She and her husband have a major company in Silicon Valley. So Susie, you're up. Okay. I am a Die Hard Warrior fan, and I was at that game. <laughs> oh. Saw, she got to see us celebrate, though, on stage. Yeah, I kind of left right when it was over. Um, but I want to ask the skaters a question, and then maybe I'll ask you Ooh, a question. Burn. Oh, burn. Burn, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's still bitter. <laughs> well, wait, what's the question? Okay. It's, a, it's an easy question. Oh, okay. How many years difference between you and age and then what about your schooling did you how how much how hard was it to go to school and what how far did you go in school I did school real good <laughs> uh, to answer your first question Alex is my older brother I know he acts so youthful and he's energetic and charismatic all those all that stuff but he's three and a half years older than by I. youthful she means immature <laughs> um, as far as yeah so three and a half year age difference uh, I am older. I'll repeat it for the room. For the people in the back, I'm older. Uh, and as far as education, it was always a really important aspect of our childhood, our upbringing. Uh, skating kind of took over our lives when we were 9 and 12 fairly early. Uh, and so we ended up moving from Connecticut to Colorado uh, to train at a new training center where we could get the best possible coaching at the time. And then we've been in Michigan for the past 14 14 years, and part of the reason why we moved to Ann Arbor was so that we could continue training at a high level, at the highest level, and also receive um, a college education. And so we both attended the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor uh, part-time, and briefly, I am still a sophomore. Um, <laughs> you know, class of 2013, what, what? Kind of, I, you know, fell off the, I fell off the wagon at some point, but, uh, I think our education in travel and the things that we've learned in sport uh, have been equal to uh, just different uh, from a traditional education, and I've learned a lot from her, so <laughs> I'll stick with her. Okay. Maya, anything to add? I think Alex really covered it. Okay. Susie, are you not going to grill him? Come on. Okay, I'll ask a question. What did you guys feel when we had all the injuries? Did <laughs> oh. She's questioning your character, Bobby. Yeah. Okay, Trying Bobby. to put an asterisk on the championship. Not really, but I was just wondering, did, was there talk about that? Did you guys change your game plan based on the injuries that we she, had? Oh, she's a real fan. Oh, gosh. Whoa, oh, inside, didn't, didn't. inside. Give us the inside. Okay, we didn't Bobby. think sports media was going to be here. It's crazy. <laughs> Everyone can have excuses. No. Um, oh. I, honestly, you don't. Okay, I, I'm not the one playing, so I'm not the one to, to talk, right? But uh, I think you're so in the moment that I don't, you know, I don't think people and the players are all that concerned about what's not happening. I think people are concerned with what's going on in front of them and whoever they're competing against. And you know, to credit all those guys, they the role players stepped up and everyone's part of a team and I, I don't think that it was a huge thing. Okay, Susie, you good? Okay, oh, Laurie Matsukawa, Kamaaina, stand up. Laurie, um, so King TV anchor, go, so, Laurie. Alex, why a franchise in Seattle? Why an NBA franchise she, in yeah. Seattle? And so Bobby, would you manage it and Koike, would you coach the dancers? Yes. All right. Yes. There go. We got it. We got I mean, it. That sounds like a great plan. Yeah. Well, I think all of us can speak on our roles uh, for this pending uh, project that we'll be taking on together as a unit. Uh, Maya and I will be running the team um, from a ownership perspective as we are. Thanks for including me. Yeah, of course. We do everything together. We're so experienced in that way. Um, we're, we're a good team. Wouldn't want to break up the team. Uh, Seattle, uh, well, the history of the NBA is such that there was a professional basketball team in Seattle for a time before they uh, it's complicated. They went to Oklahoma City, uh, and Seattle's conveniently on the West Coast, close to Japan. You guys are all invited to games, <laughs> VIP seats. Go. Free tickets for everyone. Promise, yeah. <laughs> so, Bobby, you're, you'd go and manage and be the general manager? Oh, I can't disparage Toronto yet. Ooh. Um, I gotta, I gotta Is this tampering? I Am wait. I tampering? I know, I have to wait for the offer from ownership. Uh, I gotta see if it's worth it. Dang. Well, fax one over. People still use fax machines, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, 
Other questions. Where are my Kama Ainas? Besides Lori, and by the way, she um, was for 37 years a King TV anchor, and that's why she's asking you about that Seattle deal. All right. Uh, other questions. Oh, wait, I can see some. Stand up. I can see a young woman. There you go. Can you shout out your question? Or somebody get her a microphone, please, and shout out the question. Hi. Thank you. Hello. So your Hi, name. Hello. Um, your question? OK. So um, I'm a, um, a student in the arts, and I was wondering as like um, professionals in a non-traditional career, what are some struggles and um, how do you just get through like a blank canvas, you know, because you're just walking on a blind path. So I'm just wondering how you get through each All obstacle. Right. That's a question for Koine. Perfect. Go. Um, you just do it because you love it. You know, the, the love for what we do, I think for what we all do, is what drives us. Um, it's scary that, that it's a blank white canvas, but it's also so exciting because we're the ones that create it and we're the ones that, that paint this beautiful, beautiful picture. Okay. Um, everybody, all of us have such a different story to tell. And yes, it's scary, but it's so thrilling. It's so worth it. Um, do it. Whatever you want to do, just do it because it's possible. Um, you have our support, definitely. Um, you know, it's just, if you love it, let, your, let the love and the passion for what you love drive you. You can't go wrong. You know, um, be grateful, be kind, be good people, and it will literally lead you exactly where you need to go. Alex and Maya, want to add to that? If not you, then who? That's ask, right. your, ask yourself That's that. Right. If, you're not, if you're not going to be the one to do it, then who's going to do it either instead of you? And if you don't like the answer to that, then you should probably do it. Um, yeah, I think that that's really important. I mean, I think even Bobby, everyone in their job, uh, whether it's traditional or non-traditional, uh, we all have to be creative in some aspect of our lives. And um, the creative process is just kind of a consistently frustrating thing. Um, you know, you're starting from nothing and building something. And so it's sort of the art of problem solving mm -hmm. and um, you know, conquering one task at a time. It's so easy, I think, often to look at the big, big picture and see the goal that you want to accomplish uh, and how far you realize how far away you are from reaching that. And so Maya and I have always um, been successful when we uh, have that big picture in mind, but then also set smaller goals that we can tackle uh, so that we don't set expectations too high for ourselves and we get frustrated as a result. And then also don't be afraid to allow the timeline to change and pivot in direction because a learning experience can mean so much even if you don't expect it. Okay, thank you so thank much. Thank you. All right, uh, question, can you pass the mic? I can see the handwriting, stand up. Oh, is it Jonah? Yes, it All right, Jonah, Jonah Higa. Uh, I also asked him to ask a question. Go ahead, Jonah. Excellent, um, so today uh, we heard a lot about Japan's um, position in technology and how it's going to further global uh, connections and and how do you see technology and Japan's investment in technology uh, further advance your careers? Okay, do you want to sorry, Bobby? For everybody, yeah. Okay, Bobby. <laughs> I'm not the expert here, but uh, we were just in Japan. I took the Raptors there to play Houston, and um, you know, Rocco 10 is a huge NBA sponsor. So I would say that they're already making their inroads into professional sports. Um, I went to Barcelona last year and they're a sponsor for FC Barcelona. So I think um, there's always a standard and excellence that people, you know, at least stereotypically think of Japanese technology. Um, and so the more international they become, I think people are, you know, are very accepting of it. And Koine, your parents are from Japan. Yes. So now, how would you answer Jonah's question? I mean, I, I definitely agree with what he just said. Um, and as far as my position in dancing, again, I'm, I'm not an expert in this whole technology thing, but um, you know, I think a lot of now, especially with technology, meaning social media, 
it's, it's become like a driving force in, in our industry. Um, we book a lot of jobs perps, like solely from social media, solely from Instagram and the technology that we have nowadays. And so the, the more that comes up, the more all of our opportunities will come up. And yeah, I think every, he really just answered it. Great. Uh, Maya and Alex, you add to that? Sure, I think it's been covered really well, but when it comes to technology, it's an amazing way to build bridges and understanding between people from different cultures. And so for us with social media, it's been important and fun for us to share our journey and then also connect with people all over the world. Yeah, yeah I think um, Maya's totally right, as usual. Um, <laughs> it's annoying. Uh, but as far as, yeah, as far as technology goes, when it's used for good, uh, I think yeah. it's great. Um, you know, the world we are now more connected through technology and social media um, and technology has a way of ideally making people's lives better. Uh, and, you know, the term bridge builder is something that I'm sure has been discussed a lot um, here today. Uh, but it, as far as how we utilize technology, um, we're able to connect with people all over the world, people who maybe had no interest in figure skating or didn't know what figure skating was, have learned about us um, and learned about our sport. And we've been able to share the values and the lessons that we've learned throughout our career uh, in that way. So for us, it's been a major part of how we've carried ourselves both on and off the ice. Okay, thank you. All right, other questions? Yeah, I see a hand. Oh, right here. Can you, uh, he's standing up right here. Blue shirt. Excuse me. Can, can we get him the mic really quickly? And then we'll go to the side. Sure. Go. Okay, yeah, congratulations on your success. Um, you know, when you say you fast forward 20 or 30 years and you're, uh, you had all your business and other um, entertainment success, and you're looking at your period of significance, what would you look at as, as what your legacy is going to be? And with that, do you see the Japanese American community and sustaining that as part of the fabric as you move forward? Okay, so you're addressing it to the entire panel? Whoever wants to take it. Okay, um, I, I would tell you, this is a very, I'm so proud that this is the youngest panel I've ever had. Bobby is the veteran at 35, you heard me say that in the video, 35 years young, so we're gonna give it to Bobby. Uh, well, I think it's interesting you, you brought up the point about um, the Japanese American community because I think we're all in industries where there isn't a huge Japanese American presence, and so as I think, you know, specifically to basketball, um, obviously there's not a ton of Asian basketball players, especially in the NBA. And so I think for me, and it's something that I know is to give back through basketball. Um, and obviously in Hawaii, there's a ton of Jap a ton of Japanese American kids. So I think that would be the avenue. Um, but probably the more likely scenario for them is, is what I touched on earlier, which is how do you kind of create a career? How do you, you know, how do you break through the barriers when maybe, um, you know, you don't see them there, or, or kind of what uh, the, the girl touched on earlier, which is you can't put the expectations of being an Asian American, I think, on too many people, or else it can be limiting. And so how do you kind of like free them in the sense of you, we are entering this blank canvas, and how do you get them to realize that truly anything is possible? Okay, well, you could have had Alex on your team. Remember, he wanted to be an yeah. NBA star? I always go for the rebound. I box out. I do the dirty work. <laughs> I, I will say, uh, the good, funny story, we had Jeremy Lin on our team last year, and um, after we won the championship, I'm on stage, and he, come and put, he puts his arm around me, and he didn't play a ton, and he goes, we did it for the Asians. <laughs> Which I thought was funny. Um, I saw another hand go up here, so can we move the oh, mic here? I think the mic should be right there. Can we get, can we get the mic? You've got the mic? Who's got the microphone? Let's, let's go. One here, and then let's go here. Hi, thank you. I'm Nabuka. I have a question for Maya and Alex. Uh, I have a two questions. I'm helping a Special Olympic, not the Paralympic Olympic. They are mentally challenged uh, player. They are good for sports. However, when I helped him in Austria, they couldn't move at all. Now, you are always a florist to play together. How do you advise for somebody who wanted to do it yet he couldn't move? 
That is one of the questions. And we were playing together so nicely. When you have the partner had some uh, uh, delay or some uh, problem, how do you tell that partner to overcome that uh, problem they might be had? That's what I like to hear. Thanks. Okay, Alex and Maya. So I think that the first question was how would we, um, well, you were talking about the Special Olympics, yes. Uh, yes. which is an amazing organization. Um, we, as members of the U.S. Olympic team, um, have not actually had a lot of interaction with the Special Olympics because they are from separate, um, they are separate organizations. Uh, I think that it's a very good question in that so often we're asked what we can say that might be inspiring or um, give hope and open the minds of people who are looking to do some of the similar things that we have done. Um, I would say that skating is obviously, like if you, if you are unable to move, it's really difficult to participate in skating. Um, but fortunately, the sport is one that, you know, even if you aren't able to participate, I think the reason why so many people around the world enjoy it is because it's not only that athletic aspect, but there is a true emotional storytelling. Um, you know, the heart of it is story. Um, if there was no music, if there was no choreography, it would just be tricks. Um, and so I don't, you know, I think the second, what was the second question? How do we resolve arguments? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, I could speak better on that, I think. Um, she wins. Normally, <laughs> um, I think that when we were younger, it came down to sort of a mediator, like a parent or a coach. Um, but now that we're wiser and more mature, uh, we're able to see eye to eye. I think it was particularly challenging because I am three and a half years older. And as you can all probably tell, Maya is particularly sophisticated and mature for her age, or, and she was even when she was very young. Um, she started off as being a much stronger skater than I was uh, because she had committed herself to it at a younger age and I was missing layups at the gym. Um, <laughs> and so I started skating and when we started skating together, it was a complicated thing for me to react to when a coach would try to articulate uh, something to me where you know they would want me to be better or they would try to give me instruction and they would say, oh, I'll do it how Maya's doing it. You should do it more like Maya. Uh, and being an older sibling and being used to being the one that she was always looking up to. He that, taught me how to ride a bike. I taught her how to ride a bike. So like the fact that she was better at skating than I was was a really difficult thing. And it took some time for us to sort of equilibrate and see each other as equals um, in that sense. And so sort of in our early teen years, there were some periods of time where I was I thought I was the boss, um, and not that she's the boss, but we are equal parts of the same team and we bring different strengths. And so once I kind of figured that out, um, the sailing was much smoother. Okay, thanks, Thank Alex. You. Thank you. A couple of last, qu time for a couple of last questions. Go ahead. Hey, this question is for Bobby. There are a lot of Kama Aina in the room. We're super proud of you. Two questions. What do you eat first when you go home to Hawaii? And the second question is, what parts of growing up in Hawaii have you taken with you to New York and now to Toronto? Bobby? Great. Um, so obviously being from Hawaii, I love Hawaiian food, so I always go to Helena's Hawaiian food and get uh, Kalua pig and short ribs and lomi salmon. So uh, if you guys ever go, Helena's Hawaiian food. In Kalihi? Yes. My Didn't, Karai. Yeah, I know. Karai. Aren't you, are, aren't you from there, Jan? I'm from Kalihi Valley. I, I went to Farrington. It's Not tough. a private school. <laughs> it's a public school. Okay, but go, Bobby. So uh, you, second part was, uh, you know, I I think uh, if after we won the championship, I was like given the shock on stage. I think that's just kind of like I, I know so many people were watching back home that I wanted to like give my little shout out to them. Um, as far as things I bring to uh, Toronto. I brought Aloha shirts to the coaching staff. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I think it's you know it's it's something that we all carry with us, and I hopefully like 
my personality, my spirit. People like, oh, that kid's from Hawaii, and maybe Hawaii is a cool place. I think that's probably what I'd like people to take away from me. Okay, there you go. All right. Um, any one last question in the audience? Oh, yes. Okay, right here. Right here. Fred Katayama, reporter. <laughs> television reporter. Here's your microphone, Fred. Make it a good one. You've got the last question. You put the pressure on me, Jan. All right, since we're at the U.S.-Japan Council Conference, Bobby, you grew up in Hawaii, where you're surrounded by Japanese Americans, but Koine, Maya, Alex, whether it was South Florida or Ann Arbor, Michigan, or Connecticut, I was just wondering, what does it feel like in the now to be surrounded by hundreds of mostly Japanese Americans who are supportive and adoring and were moved by you when you're on stage in the spotlight. And part two is in the spotlight or on your private life, when do you feel Japanese American? All right, good one. Koine, take that one first. Well, um, I originally wanted to speak a little bit of Japanese today, but to be honest, I'm kind of nervous because I'm not grammatically I'll probably not be saying things correctly. Um, I was born in Japan. Um, I'm fully, fully, fully Japanese, 100%. Um, I totally forgot the question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, like, what's it like? Uh, what's it like to be in a room full of Japanese American oh, people who yes. support you? And Got when it. do you feel most Japanese American when you're wow. on stage? Woo! All right, I mean, he's on it. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I feel. Oh man, I mean, I feel Japanese every, every single second. And I, and I am so, so, so proud to be Japanese. I, and it's so funny because my biggest struggle growing up in elementary school in America was that I wasn't American um, and that I looked differently. I mean, I even tried to put on makeup when I was in fifth grade because I wanted my eyes to look a little bit whiter. And, and, and it's, it's so sad, it makes me so, so sad. And, I, and sometimes I just think about it and I start crying because I'm like, why did I do that to myself? Why did I go there? But I was so little and I had no idea how proud I would be now. And I mean, sitting here and being able to talk amongst these incredible people and look in the audience and see so many Japanese people, like, whew, I can't talk, but I'm so proud. Okay, Truly. thank you. Since you asked a question, Alex, you go now. Oh. <laughs> this is your moment now. I don't think that's how this works. Um, yeah, I guess identity uh, is something that we all seek. Community is something that brings us all together. Uh, and, you know, U.S.-Japan Council and the work that that is done is so imperative and important um, in continuing the conversation and so that other people understand what Japanese Americans and Japanese American people bring to the table. Um, we grew up in the Northeast. Uh, we're not a part of a Japanese American community in Southern Connecticut. Uh, and we were in an ice rink, uh, not locked, but we were in an ice rink for a majority of the time. Uh, and so we didn't, weren't a part of many communities other than the figure skating community. Uh, and so, you know, as we've spent more time in Southern California, obviously there's a larger Japanese American presence here. Uh, and we've been traveling to Japan now for many years since 2009, 8, 2008, 2008 for competitions. And so uh, it's been a bit of a slow burn for us, um, but always honored to sort of represent both sides of who we are. Uh, whenever we've traveled to Japan, because there aren't uh, very many, or there isn't a history of ice dance uh, in Japan uh, as much. And so we always felt very welcomed and warmly supported uh, by Japanese fans and American fans. And I think as far as identity goes, when it comes to sort of how we feel Japanese American, we really do, I mean, we, it's going to sound a bit cliche, but we really do focus on being ourselves and the fact that other people identify as, as Japanese American. I guess Bobby sort of mentioned this a little bit. Um, you know, by doing you to the best of your ability, um, you put out um, that impression to the world and hopefully it's a good one that makes people think highly of where you come from and the people that look up to you and who you represent. All right, thank you. Um, good, Maya, you good? Okay. Sure. Okay. Okay, we're going to wrap it up. And um, guess what, people? I'm going to go see the Raptors on Sunday. Bobby gave me some tickets. 
<laughs> Where are my tickets? <laughs> yeah. Man, you're not supposed to say that. <laughs> she couldn't help it. All right, so uh, last question to all of them, and we'll start with Bobby. Um, what is the message for the young people, especially in this room, that you want to leave about success? I was thinking when the, when the young woman got up and asked us, you know, how do you navigate a field that maybe there's not a path? Um, and oftentimes I think that it's more mental than physical. And if I think about all the different players that have come through the Raptors or, you know, kind of how we weed them out or we trade players, it's really like most people prevent themselves from being successful in the sense that they either have an idea of what they're supposed to be, um, and I don't want to be too philosophical here, but it's, I truly feel like one of the things that helped me succeed was not having this idea of what I was supposed to be or limitations that I put on myself or my parents or the Japanese American community or the Caucasian community. And it really is like a testament to you actually can do anything if you like put your mind to it and you just people create these constructs in their head and I just think it's it really you know is debilitating for a lot of people okay thank you uh, Koine to you what words what quick words can you offer to the audience especially our young people oh man I mean if you love it just do it um, we live one life one single life and in that lifespan you might as well just do ex exactly what you want to do. And again, if you're a good person and you have the right intentions, just do it and, and love it. Okay. Yeah. Maya. Along the same lines, do and follow what you love. Know that there will be challenges that you'll have to overcome, but keep perspective and stay grateful. Mm -hmm. Alex? Work hard, do good, do well. Uh, you can do both of those things. Uh, it takes a little bit of luck but if you keep a positive mindset, you'll be surprised how often you find yourself in the right position to reap the rewards of your efforts. And so there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Bobby Webster, Koine Iwasaki, Alex, and Maya Shibutani. Thank you.